All right, time to take a look now at what's uh, grabbing headlines around the world. Uh, Flo joins us. Flo, hello again. Good morning. Uh, papers focusing on the organisation of the uh, Islamic Cooperation Summit, which kicked off yesterday in Istanbul. That's right. Now, during his opening speech, the Turkish president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, called for unity in the Muslim world. And you can read more about that on the front page of Hurriyet Daily News, the English language version of of her yet you can see he's saying that terror is a major issue in the Islamic world and that is why uh, these Muslim countries need to unite and work together uh, similar calls of unity from the Turkish Prime Minister Ahmet uh, Davutoglu you can also read about that in uh, in uh, her yet today uh, you can see he called for a common and broader view of Muslims in order to discuss the problems of the Muslim world with maturity Right, well, another regional paper has pointed out that this summit uh, opened up in a climate of division, if you will, between Muslim countries. That's right. This is Raya al Yum. It's actually a pan Arab paper based in London. It really doesn't mince its words today. It says that it's the worst summit in the history of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. It reflects all the geopolitical rivalries of a bitterly divided Middle East. Uh, the paper goes on to say that such a divided organization will never be able to find uh, solutions to the real problems like terrorism and Islamophobia. And worse, it's probably going to throw oil on the fire because it's so divided. All right, well, let's stay in the region. Uh, Egypt's Prime Minister, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, is in something of hot water, if you will, for offering two islands to Saudi Arabia. That's right. It's a very interesting story that's getting a lot of attention in the region. I pulled out an article, first of all, from Asafir. That's a Lebanese paper. So Egypt handed over these two islands, which are located in the Red Sea. They're called Senafir and Tiran, uh, and essentially gave them to Saudi Arabia as a show of gratitude for the kingdom's immense economic aid. Now, these are very strategic islands uh, that are, are strategic because uh, you have to go th pa past them to get to ports in Israel uh, and in Jordan. And Cairo has controlled them since uh, the 1950s. Egyptians are outraged because they've always been told that these islands are Egyptian and that they had to be protected especially with respect to Israel. And here you have the president kind of just giving them away uh, to Saudi Arabia behind their backs. And a lot of Egyptians have actually t taken to social media to blast the Egyptian president. They use the hashtag, it Egypt is sold, essentially accusing him of selling these islands to uh, to, uh, to Saudi Arabia. It must be said, they're uninhabited islands. Uh, the comedian Bassem Youssef, for instance, he tweeted, an island will cost you a billion, a pyramid will cost you two billion, and you'll get two statues thrown in as a gift. <laughs> Right, now this agreement is going to be subject to a vote in Parliament. Some are saying, though, a referendum is what's needed. That's right. If we take a look at Ashur Rukh, that's actually an Egyptian paper, you can see they're reporting on the fact uh, that lawyers actually have taken the matter to court uh, to contest the deal. And they say that according to the Egyptian constitution, Egyptians should have a say in the matter. And so they're calling for a referendum to be held. Now, what's interesting is this is a very strategic deal between Egypt and Saudi Arabia, and it's paving the way for the construction of a bridge between Saudi Arabia and uh, Sharm Sheikh in, uh, in Egypt. And this was announced uh, last weekend during the visit uh, by King Salomon when he went to Egypt. All right, moving on uh, to U.S. politics, there's lots of focus on next week's uh, Democratic primary in New York. That's right. Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders had a very fiery debate uh, last night in Brooklyn. The gloves really came on. This is uh, off, rather. <laughs> the gloves came off. This is an interesting uh, article in The Daily Beast that says, look, most people accept, ex expect uh, Hillary Clinton to win the race. But what's really going to count is the margin, uh, how, how it'll determine how left uh, New York is. And so you can see the Daily Beast says, for lefties, it's really a battle for the soul of, of New York City. The Daily Beast also has an interesting interview with someone we don't really hear about that much, and that's Bernie Sanders' wife, uh, Jane Sanders. It's a very candid interview, wide-ranging. She talks about all, th all sorts of things, the need for party unity, the fact that she misses her family, and this incredible thing. Bernie and I will vote for Hillary if we have to, have to. And she says that she hopes that Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton will vote for Bernie if they have to. It's, yeah, quite unlikely, though, but we, we shall see how things pan out. Uh, the spotlight uh, on U.S. politics, but another more discreet candidate is... Uh taking place, a candidate race, if you will, is taking place in New York at the same time. That's right. That's the race for the UN Secretary General. <laughs> Quite a big race. You can read more about it in the UN News Center. They have a, a website that, that t tells you all about what's happening in the at the UN. Uh, of course, the Secretary General is described as the world's top diplomat 
or the most impossible job on the planet. Those are the two descriptions. Now, it's interesting because for the very first years, well, the first 70 years of the UN's existence, selecting the, uh, the Secretary General has been a very secretive thing. Uh, according to The Guardian, it was as transparent as a papal conclave in the Vatican, but the uh, process has really changed. It's been revolutionized. It's trying to become more democratic, more open. Uh, and actually, for the ver very first time ever, a public debate took place between the candidates. There are eight candidates for uh, the top job. Uh, and on top of that public debate, they had a, a very public job interview as well that was very intense, according to the Daily Beast. They had to give a 10-minute vision speech in front of the whole General Assembly, and then they faced questions for two hours. So the Daily Beast says this was very intense, and yet uh, eight people are wanting to do this top job, go through this intense period. Also, this this whole thing was uh, live-streamed across the world, so it was very public uh, a very big change compared to the way it used to be. And another novelty is half of the candidates, half of those eight, eight candidates are women. Uh, and so if we take a look at this cartoon in China, China Daily today, they wonder, will the captain, I guess the captain of the world here, will it be a woman? Kind of a weird cartoon, it must be said. <laughs> just a little, just a little weird flow. But uh, I think, yeah, the world's uh, most impossible job is probably the way I describe it. All right, Flo, thank you very much uh, for the International Papers Roundup for us.